my pleasure to welcome Dr. Putterman to the School of Kinesiology in his position as a Canada Research Chair. He uh, comes to us by way of um, University of uh, California, San Francisco. I almost said San Diego, pardon me. But uh, to, to make this a little bit more personal, and uh, the word excellence was raised earlier, uh, and I'll tell you three things about Eli which uh, really foster excellence in my mind and hopefully within our school. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit about the work that he does uh, today, but he, he really is at the forefront of the intersection between basic biology, psychiatry, and trying to understand exercise and how these three things interface and modulate one another. And he doesn't approach this from a binary perspective, which is what many of us have done. And I really think that his coming to the school will take us to places that we haven't even thought about trying to address before, <coughs> which has been a real uh, treat to have around our school. Uh, second, I was happened to be on the search committee, which hired Eli. And he stood apart from the other people that interviewed, who are all equally excellent. Uh, his capacity for mentorship of graduate students really stood out. He's a person that really cares about his graduate students. He's got an excellent track record of that. And I think that will really help out uh, around our school, and it will foster greater things to come. So I'm really pleased about that. And lastly, I'll, I'll be brief, uh, he's an all-around good guy. <laughs> and, and I mean that with sincerity. To have him as a colleague within the department has changed the tenor of committees, meetings that you sit in on, and I can't uh, emphasize, don't underestimate that. That really makes a difference to have someone who's young, enthusiastic, rolls up their sleeves, and helps out. Uh, it's, it's terrific around our school, and I'm pleased to have him as a colleague uh, in the school and within the Faculty of Education. Eli, welcome. So my research area as a psychologist is whether stress can actually kill you. And our field of health psychology and behavioral medicine really has spent the past 30 years, 40 years, diving deep into this question. Um, and the answer is kind of yes. Uh, so if you look at this meta-analysis, meta-analysis is you take a bunch of studies that have already been done and you summarize them into one larger study. So this is a study of studies. And if you, it's hard to read this, but if you look at this meta-analysis of, this, of these um, na nationally representative data in, the, in Europe, that over an eight-year period, roughly, uh, the greater uh, uh, people who reported psychological stress at baseline of these studies, the more likely they were to die on average over the next eight years. So uh, for this, it was a, for one standard deviation on this one questionnaire, there was a 20% increased risk of potentially dying. And what was really interesting about these, the study is that everyone was free of a disease beforehand. So it's not like they started off with some diseases um, that may have been promoting their stress. Um, well, at least there was no self-report of those diseases. They, they may have been underlying. But when we ask the question, how, how does this happen? How does stress get into our body and kill us? There's the stress response. So right now, um, I, uh, I'm a little stressed. I'm just talking in front of my colleagues and my, and my peers and, uh, and friends. And uh, what happens is we stimulate areas in response to stress in the brain. And the, there's different areas, and I'm not going to get into them. And they send out these pathways through the autonomic nervous system or through the neuroendocrine system. These are two systems that are very heavily involved in us responding to stress. The left side, the autonomic system, if you've heard of the fight or flight response, that's what starts us with our fight or flight response. That lets us know that we need to be active right now and either fight the threat, so I'm like jump at Bly and like because he's attacking me with his eyes. I, I said so, no, uh, either or or uh, or run away from the situation, and that's a typical fight or flight response. If there is no real threat that would actually hurt me and damage me. We then stimulate this neuroendocrine response, which stimulates cortisol, which is a bit more of a delayed or lag response um, that kind of gets us more alert and keeps us alert during the stressful experience. Together, they impact our physiology, they impact our brain, they impact all these different physiological systems, shut them down or turn them up and get them ready. One of the systems is the immune system. And the immune system is really important because the immune system, when it gets older and older, over time, which is a natural process of aging, but is also accelerated by this entire system, 
over time, when this immune system gets too old, it will actually cause cardiovascular disease, cause uh, renal problems, cause brain damage and Alzheimer's disease. So this system, which is a naturally occurring system, over time, if it gets stimulated too often, it gets worn down and ages. I focus on the immune system so far in my research. So in my research, we focus on this, uh, these uh, ends of the DNA. So we have our DNA that codes for all the proteins that are needed for our bodies to function. That's the purple. There's this other part, these yellow parts, that are just these DNA pieces, TTAGGG, repeated thousands and thousands and thousands of times, that in the past, you, they, because they don't code for anything, they don't make a single protein, they used to think that that was junk DNA, that it was unnecessary DNA. And Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for discovering the purpose of telomeres, for coding the gene, for also discovering the enzyme that lengthens the telomeres, um, she, she discovered that actually the whole purpose of the telomere is to protect all the purple part. By keeping them long for processes that I won't that into, by keeping the telomeres really long, we're saving all the purple. But when they get too short, that's when the immune system gets too old and doesn't function very well. So in this one study that is currently uh, revised and resubmit, uh, excitingly in PNAS, um, we went into the study called the Health and Retirement Study, which is a nationally representative study in the United States, and we went and we found all the possible adverse, adversity questions. So, did you have to relocate due to financial difficulties when you were a child? Did your parents physically abuse you? Were your parents alcoholic? Uh, were they, uh, did they substance, uh, abuse substances? Uh, did you have to repeat schools? And also all these adversities from adulthood. At any point over this 20 year period that they've been collecting data, did you lose a child? Did you lose uh, a spouse? Did you experience a natural disaster and so on? And we added up all these different uh, adverse events to look to see whether um, they predict getting, having shorter telomeres. So if you looked at all this data from 20 years of these individuals' lives, if you then drew some, uh, got some saliva to get their telomere length, what we found was that there was a risk of uh, adversity on having short telomeres. And this, is, this supports the past 10 years worth of research in this field showing that caregiving leads to short telomeres or uh, unemployment is related to short telomeres. This is looking at just accumulating all these different, different events over a lifespan. Um, and so they were related to telomere length. And that's uh, just a cross section saying now your short telomeres and what has happened over the past 20 years in your life. In this study, we looked prospectively a year period. And we got people to report over that one year period events that may have happened to look to see whether they got shorter or longer from what they were supposed to over that one year period. And what you see is if they are uh, above the zero, they got longer. And if they're below the zero, they got shorter. And what you see is that for every extra event, they got shorter over the year. So the question is, is it the end of the world for people who experience adversity in their lives? I, don't, I say no. I have focused on this resiliency piece, this idea that we can uh, be resilient to psychological stress or to actual real events. And how do we become resilient is our lifestyle, our psychological stress resilience, our ability to be optimistic, our ability to, uh, uh, to feel mastery in our lives, and also feeling socially connected with the others. And these are from all these different literatures, and I put through them into this multi-system resiliency. And if we look at that data where we showed over a one-year period that people who had more events got shorter, if they were physically active, the higher they were physically active, the number of events that occurred over that year no longer predicted how short they got. So they may have shortened, they may have lengthened, but it was not related to the events that were happening. But if they were physically inactive, which is the red, they were likely to shorten with more events that occurred. And this was not just true for physical activity, it was true for the types of food they were eating and also their sleep quality. So it was true across a bunch of different health behaviors. Um, this has been supported by some of my other work as well. But the question is, the chicken and the egg, is it that high stress people who remain physically active, they're just somehow biologically different. And the only way we can answer those questions is with interventions by taking fit, uh, unfit people and turning them into fit people. And they might not 
where, I mean, my goal is not to turn people into athletes who are, you know, all champion, but can we take people and make them physically fit and physically healthy if they are very high stress? And if they are very high stress and we change some of the, uh, we change their activity levels, are we then going to change their telomere length, their telomerase levels, and make their immune system more, uh, more robust? And this is a study that is just wrapping up. I have no data on it. Uh, in San Francisco, I'll have data in like five months. Um, uh, it's going to be done in July, and then I'll be sending out all my blood from San Francisco to all my labs that I'm collaborating with to assay and check to see whether a six-month intervention in very high-stress family caregivers of Alzheimer's patients can uh, can change their physiology. Um, I have just completed a, uh, a stage two foundation grant, which we'll find out, Heather and I will find out in about three weeks, whether I move on to stage three, um, that will tackle all the other areas of the stress response. So are we able to change the activation of different neural regions? Are we able to change how much cortisol is outputted or how fast we recover in our cortisol? or our autonomic nervous system. And all this research is going to be happening in MedBlock C. This is the renovation from the CFI grant. And if you look very, very close into the window, you see Heather. <laughs> Heather has been instrumental to all the research so far that I have completed here. She helped me write my CFI. She helped me write my BCKDF. She uh, was instrumental in my CRC and my foundation grant. So I want to thank Heather and thank everyone for this time. And, yeah, thank you.